we've seen some of that fatty acid modulation and I think it's just how the cow it's getting ready or set up for 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 conception that that communication between embryo and the uterus that some fatty acids that are needed there host of the Dairy Nutrition Black Belt Podcast. My guest today is Dr. Phil Cardosa. He's an associate professor at the University of Illinois. He does research and extension in the areas of both nutrition and, and reproduction and how those two interact. Phil, welcome to the, to the Black Belt. Glad to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Happy, to, happy you agreed. Uh, you recently, your group recently published a paper in Journal Dairy Science looking at associations between metritis and production and, and reproduction measures. And that's what I'd like to talk about. And I guess to start things off, what's the definition you guys used for metritis? There's a lot of definitions out there, so we have to define what, what we're talking about. Yeah, that's that's a very good point. So in this uh, work, you know, there's a lot of information about uh Mentritis and endometritis out there, but the way we are classifying is that we are actively going inside the uterus of the cow and we are collecting epithelial cells as well as inflammatory cells with that brush, with the cytobrush we call, at 15 and 30 days. And then we are counting those cells and we are saying, hey, if you have more than a certain percentage, we're going to say that that cow has... Uh, endometritis. That may not be clinically, but actually that's something we explore in that paper as well, is the connection between, hey, this is happening in the body of the uterus because we know the information, we have the cells. That's, let's say, the gold standard definition for it. Uh, then we are also comparing that with the vaginal discharge that we call. That will be a little bit more active than just walking behind the cows and seeing some secretion coming out of it because we have this matter check device, you know, that we go actively with a rubber piece and collect secretions that may be sitting in the vagina of the cow. And then we also connect with the ovaries of the cow. And we try to build the whole story and the connection with the part that we have that is the individual intake of the cows. And I think that's the, the strength of that work is being able to connect to individual intake and individual milk yield uh, performance because you know when we go out to commercial farms that's where uh, it, it's the hard information to get so uh, your your paper your definition is much more sensitive than this clinical clinical metritis where you see a a, a, a discharge basically that's correct and, and actually we you know uh, the way we classify that discharge you can have a score uh, from one to three based on is it, does it have pus or is it too white or is very clear or if it has a smell or not, you know? And then you add those two information and then you say, yes, this cow has a purulent vaginal discharge. And we associated that coming out of the vagina with what was coming from the uterus. And we saw that around that 15 days, that's pretty accurate. So if you're actively seeing some secretion coming out of the cow on 15 days, that's really telling you that that cow has something going on in the uterus. However, at 30 days, that didn't get as clear, that association, at least uh, with our data set. Um, uh, so it's kind of uh, maybe encouraging to have, you know, farmers, uh, veterinarians checking, especially on that second week of lactation, so they can catch early on some of these problems and then making sure you know, conception rate at first breeding, that happens in a nice way. So we say, hey, if you're not getting 45, 40% conception rate on your first breeding, something is wrong behind, you know, like probably transition period, uh, uterine disease, something's going on. Okay, so what, what were some of the, and these are associations, not necessarily direct cause and effect, but what were some of the associations you found between your measure of metritis and let's stick, let's start with production measures. Yeah, so the, as you could expect that cows, they produce anywhere from uh, two to three kilos less milk if they were classified as on the high group of having that metritis. 
And even interesting enough, prepartum and postpartum, they also had lower consumption of intake. So it, it's kind of, you know, like you highlighted pretty well, there's associations, right? Uh, we don't expect that the cow maybe have some inflammation in the uterus, perhaps prepartum, but perhaps that lack of intake is already associated with what's going on after calving. Uh, and, and, and again, we are talking about intake. We didn't dive enough on each one of those nutrients. So we know that intake, we relate to glucose. You know, we know that glucose affects how well the cow can build immune defense and work with uh, uh, uterine involution. We know that calcium is involved and other minerals and vitamins may be involved there. So if I have a cow with the lower intake prepartum, maybe that's what's also causing some of these issues after calving. And that's, I guess, what I was going to ask. Do you think, and you may have answered this, do you think they, they have low intake because they're sick already or do they're not eating and that predisposes them to sickness post calving. Yeah, I, I know I, you can't answer it. This would be an opinion question. Yeah, I think I think it's very hard to 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 know that, but I would think that there's a lot of uh um things that are are happening that could impact that intake. So if we change, you know, if we go too hard on that control energy diet and we put too much straw, cows just don't get the intake, we see a lot of problems coming after calving. Uh so I would think in this case, because we would assume the uterus and everything is perfect there, uh, that that some things happen with those cows that may be associated with this pathology, not the other way around. But I mean, we would have probably to be doing, you know, biopsies in utero to be checking all that. And so well, I guess a controlled study where you control, you actually reduced intake yeah. as a treatment and then followed it up. But that's. That's always a question on chicken or egg. Yeah. Um, what did you find on reproduction then with the connection between metritis? And, so and so on the reproduction, like we went until, you know, uh, we didn't check for uh, pregnancies. That's our data set was not set up for that. But we saw some effect on ovulation. So the cows that had metritis, they had lower days to first ovulation. So it's like the inflammation or the inflammatory um, biomarkers, let's say, they didn't allow that follicle to grow enough for the first for that ovulation. That's how we interpret that data, where if the cow didn't have or didn't experience uterine inflammation or metritis, then they had the chance, the ovary had the chance to grow and ovulate to a more um, natural, normal uh, size, let's say. So there is some impact on the quality of the oocyte. So all those little things we know are going to impact pregnancy. So we believe if we were able to follow those cows, that would be, you know, impact on pregnancy. But then again, I'll, perhaps our uh, data set is not the best one set up for that. And um, others have shown that impact of endometritis into pregnancy. But now I think we were able to highlight the nuances like, hey, Ovulation is not be, it's being impacted uh, as well. Introducing Ultrasorb R3.0, Volac's comprehensive and complete solution to reduce the negative impact of naturally occurring toxins on ruminants. Ultrasorb R3.0 is a species-specific product designed to mitigate the effects of specific mycotoxins in the gastrointestinal tract of ruminants. Ultrasorb R3.0 also offers lipopolysaccharide binding capabilities. Endotoxins such as LPS can contribute to inflammation in ruminants with energy partitioned to mount an immune response instead of production. Learn more about Ultrasorb R3.0 at volac.com. It's just, to, and this is a little bit outside your paper, but just to finish up, um, is there is there nutritional interventions that can reduce that's been shown to reduce this metritis, or uh, do you know of any? I, I, I know you, you didn't study this. I, yeah, I didn't study, but it, you know, like uh, there is very nice research coming out of Florida. Uh, you know, uh, Staples Santos follow up a little bit on that on this trying to modulate with fats and fatty acids the type of prostaglandins that are going to be released. So, for example, in the first 30 days when we want uterine involution, we use types of uh, omega fatty acids that allow for that pathway of 
progesterone to get to prostaglandins. However, when we are trying to get the cow bread, then we would change that to the omega. And to be honest, I don't remember right now if it is omega-3, omega-6, but there was some of those fatty acids that you could modulate. And uh, we've seen that happening, uh, coming back to to that uh, methionine work, we've seen some of that fatty acid modulation. And I think it's just how the cow, it's getting ready or set up for, for, for conception that, that communication between embryo and the uterus, that's some fatty acids that are needed there. Uh, but I, I don't understand that yet, but I think that's matter of future research to understand as well as, can I just go behind a cow, smell it, and that will be the same as giving all these scores and I don't have to be doing, because the score from one to two to three, it's kind of, hey, how sensitive are you on a visual thing, you know? So if we could just do, hey, if it smells, that is an issue there. There's some bacteria. That's what we should be treating, not this course. So. Well, again, this has been interesting, Phil. Thank you for, for joining us today. Oh, thanks for having me.